Okay, so we have our static website set up in S3, but we really don't understand a lot about how it works or how S3 works. So in order to take our static site and turn it into something dynamic and an application, we're going to need to cover a couple things. Uh, the first thing we're going to cover in this section is a little bit more about S3 so that we understand what it does more than just as a place to dump files. The other thing we're going to cover is a bit of JavaScript. So we're going to go over some basics and we're going to make some Ajax calls to start turning our boring static site into something that's actually dynamic and useful. So let's go into some more depth here. One of the first things we did when we uploaded our serverless application to play around with was upload all that static data, the HTML and JavaScript and CSS into S3. And S3, as we've mentioned, is the simple storage service. So let's go into more depth about what S3 is and how it works. S3, again, stands for Simple Storage Service. Three S's there, hence the name S3. Fundamentally, it is what we call a key blob store. So even though people kind of think about it as a file system, it's really not a file system. It's just a system for storing blobs of data, you know, objects that are stored as generic blobs of information. And those blobs are associated with unique key names, okay? So the objects themselves, the blobs, are just binary data with a little bit of metadata surrounding it that S3 maintains. For example, the creation time, the E tag, that stands for entity tag. It's like a digital fingerprint for the data. Uh, the content type, things like that. Now, it is only eventually consistent. So that means that if you put something into S3, it doesn't mean you can read it right away. It might take a little bit of time for that data to propagate through all of S3 and be replicated to a point where you can actually read back from it. Now, it usually becomes consistent quite quickly. So it's not really a, a problem in practice for most cases. I mean, we're not trying to use S3 as some transactional database or something like that. We're just using it to upload files and then build a website off of that. So if there's a few seconds in between uploading our data and it becoming available to the world, that's okay in our use case here. Not a big deal. But the good thing about S3 is that it's extremely durable. Once you put something in S3, it's going to stay there until you do something to it. And S3 is one of the oldest and most stable AWS services out there. It's extremely reliable, extremely durable. You put stuff in S3, you can rest pretty easy that you're not going to lose that data. Now, like we said, S3 is not a file system, even though a lot of people think about it that way and it's easy to use it in that metaphor. Remember, there is no such thing as file names or directories in S3. There are only keys, key values that are associated with blobs of information. Maybe those blobs are the same thing as a file to you. That's fine. And maybe you're faking things out by making your keys look like paths to a file in a directory structure. You can do that, but just remember, it's all smoke and mirrors. You can't really list a directory in S3. All you can do is list a prefix. So if you give it a prefix of a what looks like a file path, that's how you can fake S3 out into looking like a file system. But fundamentally, it really isn't one. Directories don't exist. The console is just trying to fool you when you see directories in it or if you're using some external third-party application like S3 browser. There are no directories. There are only prefixes that you can make look like directories. This is important because in the file system, operations tend to be atomic. That means that when you write something, it's immediately available to be read back, and that's not the case with S3. Like we said, it is eventually consistent. Now, you can use E tags, entity tags, to set up conditional operations. So if you really need to do something conditional where you want to read back a blob after you've written it, there, there are ways of doing that reliably. But generally speaking, remember S3 is not the same thing as a file system. Don't try to make S3 work like your local hard drive or SSD drive. It's just not the same thing. Let's talk about policies. When you're making your data readable or publicly accessible in S3 through the console, under the hood, there's a policy definition being created there. And policies are gonna be used throughout this course for various purposes. For example, there might be a policy definition associated with individual users that define what an, an individual user in AWS has access to within your account. These are textual definitions, like little snippets that look like JSON code that define exactly what a user can access, what's read-only, what's write-only, what's not accessible at all, right? And you can set up very complex rules there if you want to. You can also set up policies for other AWS services. So for example, when we're using the Lambda service later on, we need to define what the Lambda service has access to within S3, for example. Can my Lambda service write into my S3 bucket? A policy definition is how you would define that level of access control. And you can also, 
attach AWS access control policies to resources such as, for example, an S3 bucket. So this is a handy dandy way of changing the default access policy on an entire bucket at once. And in fact, that's what we're going to do right now. So it's a little bit cumbersome to keep changing the access control on our S3 data to public every time we upload something because we're going to be uploading a lot of stuff in this course. So wouldn't it be easier if we just set a policy on our S3 bucket that says, hey, everything in this bucket is going to be publicly readable. It's meant for a website. It's, it's okay, guys, really. AWS, don't worry about it. It's all good. So let's take a look at this policy definition and break it down and what it actually means. The first thing you see is the version, and that just defines a version of the policy definition itself. Basically, it's identifying the format of the policy itself. So we're using the 2012-10-17 version of the AWS policy definition. Now, the ID can be pretty much anything you want. Uh, this was actually auto-generated by AWS's policy generation tools. So uh, we just went ahead and stuck with what it generated for us there. And then the statement defines the policy itself. So you can see it has this bracket here that defines the statement information. And within that, we have a single entry there within curly brackets. You can actually have multiple uh, definitions there within the statements if you need to. Sometimes you have more complex things going on. But in this case, we just have one. And the first line there is called the SID or SID. That's basically just another unique identifier, but this time it's for the statement instead of for the policy itself. The effect is saying that we want to allow access as part of this policy. We could also deny access, which is useful when you're layering policies on top of each other. But what we're trying to do right now is allow access to this bucket to everybody. And that's what the principal star means. That star wildcard means that anyone has access to this resource that we're going to define right now. The action is the specific operations that we want to be affected by this policy. So the action name in question here is S3 colon get object. That means if someone is trying to retrieve information from this resource in S3, that's what we want this policy to affect. And finally, we specify the resource itself, which is going to be an ARN. The ARN stands for Amazon Resource Name, and that's going to be an AWS S3, followed by your bucket name. So your unique bucket name will go there when we're actually using this. Slash star, meaning it will apply to everything in that bucket. All right, so you know, just to take another step back here, what we have here is a access policy definition that we can attach to AWS in our account. And it says that we want to open up our bucket and everything in it to everybody and allow access to everyone that's trying to do a get object call on this bucket. So the end result of this is that anyone trying to access this information in our bucket will be granted permission to read it. All right, so let's actually go hands-on and do this in your own bucket. So please follow along with me here. Head on over to console.aws.amazon.com and log in with the account that you created earlier. And once you're in here, select the S3 service. You can either select it here or put it in the search box there to find it. And select the S3 bucket that you created earlier. For me, that's FK and Sundog serverless, but for you, it will be something else because those bucket names need to be unique globally. And once you're inside your bucket, click on the permissions tab and now we're gonna click on bucket policy. So this is where we can paste in a policy definition for the entire bucket as a whole. Now to save you some typing, we've included that policy definition in the resources for this course. So if you go back to the resources folder that you extracted in the previous lecture, if you go to the V2 folder under resources, you'll find a policies folder in there. And if you open up that s3-bucket.json file in a text editor of some sort, for example, on Windows, you can just right click on that and say, open with WordPad, it'll work as well as anything. You can go ahead and select all of that and copy it, control C, and then head on back over to the bucket policy editor here in the AWS console and hit control V to paste it in. And there you have it. Make sure that you replace your bucket name with your bucket name. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace that here with fkane sundog dash serverless, substitute your own bucket name there instead. Okay, so hit pause and take care of typing that in. Once you've got that in there, all you have to do is hit save. And now check it out, this bucket has public access. So the bucket policy is now public, you can see that right there. And from now on, anything that we upload into this bucket will automatically be publicly accessible, which is exactly what we want given that we're creating a website. So, hey, we're done, cool. That wasn't so hard, right? So congratulations, 
You have now used S3 and actually set a custom bucket policy on it to allow public access to it. Woohoo!